So about uh, about uh, pen and paper, I work in a startup and we had like an engineering team and it was a small company, like a small number of people. So it was five of us who were kind of uh, developers and from four of, uh, from five of us, all five had like a, a piece of paper and kind of a notebook with a, with a pen next to the keyboard. All of all of us, right? And we didn't talk about it. We didn't like you know discuss it. But like everybody had this practice of having that. Such like uh, one guy, for example, had like uh, things like he had multiple terminals open and he was doing different things at the same time. So he had this pen and paper kind of a stack trace of what was the next thing he needs to check in the terminal, whether it's finished or not, right? So he was kind of using that for just keeping track of what was the next thing he needs to kind of do because he was kind of context switching. So he, he used this as a sort of a kind of a whiteboard thing for him to context switch, right? Um, different people use it different way, but it's, it's very useful practice. So kind of do this as well. Uh, all right, so are you set? It's kind of like a state of the affair check. Um, how are we doing? Uh, most of the time people who are here or people who are attending lectures are kind of here. So I actually don't see people who are here <laughs> because they are usually not here, uh, but great. That's really encouraging. Yeah, perfect. Looks good. So if you are if you if you in this category, then you really need to catch up. If you're here, yeah, you should sort of uh make sure you jump to that category very quickly. Um All right, basic syntax. So function patterns, function guards, if expressions let in case brackets and the dollar sign and then function composition uh, and carrying. So all of those, I assume, are no problematic anymore. You probably had enough exposure such that you are familiar with all of those plus the function patterns, pattern matching. Uh, but function composition and carrying, they may be still counterintuitive, right? You basically need to work on it. Um, so Haskell is kind of unique uh, with this carrying being built in uh, and the function composition is like how do you combine logic like how you combine things to to work together right sometimes you have to uh, compose functions with a dot sometimes you have to compute something and pass it to another function or sometimes you want a more elaborate structure right we're gonna talk about it um, uh, today and and in the next few weeks so how is your understanding about pattern matching and destructuring? This is very um, common in both Haskell and Rust. So pattern matching and uh, destructuring is very common use case in Rust and Haskell. It's non-existent in C or C++. There is a little bit of it in, in Golang. Like you do have some restructuring for, um, for some things in, um, and other programming languages, but not as much, right? Yeah, good that nobody's in this category. <laughs> so again, practice it, right? Uh, just try to make your problems, make use of pattern matching and destructuring. Pattern matching in Rust is very common. You, you do use it with this match statement a lot, um, but it's limited. It's much more powerful in Haskell, right? Um, Okay, so if then, all right, so we have some, some quizzes. So if then else, what it is? That should be easy because I, I mentioned what it is like a few seconds ago. All right, half, half. So it is an expression. Um, it's probably, 
it's not a statement in Haskell. Uh, it is uh, not a statement in Rust neither. In Rust, it's also an expression, right? It doesn't say in Haskell, but um, it can be a statement in some programming languages. So partially that's true. Uh, it is a language construct. So that's partially true as well, but th this is the kind of a correct answer. Like it, it fits the best. Um, you can, it, it is, it is an expression in uh, in Rust as well, and it is often used as an expression um, in uh, in Rust. But yeah, so you understand it? Yeah, it's super. Um, it's super easy. It, the only thing you need to remember is that if you use it as an expression, you have to have the else part, right? If you're using it as a statement, it's kind of doesn't care about the else part, but if you're using it as an expression, it has to have the else part. All right, one more. Whoops. Sorry, this one. Harder, similar, similar distribution. Uh, it's not an expression and it's not a statement in itself because you have to use it in a function definition, right? Um, so function definition is what it comes after the name and the equality sign, right? So that, that the body of the function is the function definition. Function declaration is the signature, is like what it takes and what it returns, right? Um, case of. Or match in Rust. So case of in Haskell or match in Rust are kind of the same. Perfect. Okay, so now we have the It's not compulsory. So it's a good practice and we almost always do it, but it's definitely not compulsory unless the compiler cannot work out something. Then it asks us like, what do you mean? Like what types do you really mean, right? But in generally, a uh, compiler can work it out and it's not compulsory. Uh, is it compulsory in, in Rust? Yeah, you cannot really have a function um, um, declaration or like you cannot really have a function without the declaration of its types. Uh, but if you're doing the um, the anonymous function, then uh, the compiler will try to infer what comes in and what comes out of the of the uh, anonymous functions that you have. Right? Um, they call them closures. I always have a rant about that because uh, anonymous functions and closures are not the same things. And in Rust, they call anonymous functions closures and some of them are closures and some of them are not closures, right? Um, we will talk about it when we go to um, to, to Rust. Uh, so I, I am kind of against them calling them all closures because some of them are actually not closures. They are just anonymous functions. Um, Anyway, uh, for anonymous functions, you don't need, uh, but generally in, in Rust, you have to have it. All right, so 
We have a few more slides and then we'll have a break. So let's see how we're doing. Homer is leading the pack. So brackets and the dollar sign. So brackets and the dollar sign work the same in Haskell. True or false? In some edge cases, they are almost the same, but in most cases they are not. So that's false. Um, so you, we typically have a preference to using brackets. So unless it is obvious that you only want to combine the whole, like part of the expressions with the final parameter, then you kind of do the, the final thing with the dollar sign. But yeah, it, it, yeah it, it's kind of hard to, to, to explain. So sometimes we have code which looks like this. Um, um, so we, we have kind of a, a, a statement, dollar, dollar sign statement, dollar sign statement, dollar sign. And then that that's fine, right? It would be kind of more awkward with, with brackets, right? So then we usually do this kind of a dollar sign. If you want to convert it to brackets, it would be kind of a mess, less readable, right? Uh, but most of the time, uh, we only use uh, dollar sign if you have something, and then there is this final uh, thing that is passed as the initial thing to this. And this usually is a kind of composition. Uh, so you usually have some sort of a composition which takes this as an argument, right? So that's kind of a pattern which you will see often or the other one which I showed you. Uh, a pattern where you have brackets and some dollar sign kind of sp sprinkled in usually is not that readable. Uh, so usually you sort of avoid that. So usually you try to rewrite it with uh, dots and with this kind of a final final thing like this, right? Uh, but it, yeah, there is no really like a rigorous kind of a way of, of saying what you should and shouldn't use. You have to sort of judge it uh, yourself, like how readable it is, how nice it feels. Okay, so th this is like the, the state of affairs, like how, um, how comfortable, how, um, um you know confident you are so on the left hand side we have you are not confident at all and then on the right hand side you're like oh fully confident like uh how to use it and how it works okay so then it's a little bit of a check of where we are with the recursion false and then applicative monads you probably should be towards the left because we haven't covered it yet um and then with point free notation uh, you can use it, but it's a little bit, it feels like, I, I remember when I was learning Haskell, it feels a little bit hard. Uh, after a while, it feels nice, but initially it feels a little bit awkward. And then carrying, yeah, carrying is kind of built in. Uh, we pass those partial functions all around. So it's, it's an important uh, element, but we haven't done a lot uh, with this, right? So... It is kind of for me uh, on what to focus on. Uh, we will be covering applicatives and monads uh, in the next couple of weeks. So I'm, I'm hoping this will go up. Um, I'm hoping those two will kind of take care of themselves, but we will see. Uh, last semester folds were a little bit problematic. Okay. Thanks. And then a little bit more. So some of you started doing using maybe or either. Uh, those are kind of a two new types which are very common in Haskell and in Rust. They are kind of non really existing in uh, C++ or Golang. So they are kind of new. Um, mapping and F mapping, those are useful things on lists. So you probably are familiar with how to use them. Yeah, that's a good spread uh, because map is for lists. And fmap is for other structures, which are sort of similar, right? Um, we didn't do applicatives and we didn't do bind for monads. So those should be low. Um, and the rest I'm hoping is a little bit more towards right. 
So maybe and either are very similar to option and result in Rust and being familiar with it will help you uh, with Rust a lot. Yeah, so if you're in a kind of this right-hand side category for those, that's great. If you're not, uh, yeah, you, you do need to practice more. If you're kind of on the left-hand side here, that's fine because that's what we will be doing kind of next. Um, all right, so I have, I think, two more things and then we'll have a, a break. All right, we have a little bit of reshuffling uh, and uh, yeah, why you didn't do the quiz? Who did the Haskell quiz? I've done it twice. All right, so th those of you who didn't do it, why you didn't do it? Yeah, all right. So um, I think it, it is designed to be kind of a learning tool. It is designed for you to do it and kind of learn by doing it, right? Uh, so I encourage you to do it. Um, those people who, who did it, like, did you uh, learn something from it? So please, please do it. it. It's a very good refresher of the baseline, right? It's relatively straightforward. You have to pay attention, but it's quite easy in terms of the requirements. Um, but it is the base which we will build on. Uh, so I, I do encourage you to, um, to do it. Uh, why not everybody is doing all the labs? Same reasons, time, Obliques, uh, I don't know what else you. High difficulty. Good. Some people have done all of them. Great. So. Um, some some courses are such that you can kind of a cram and uh, like. Um, gem like towards the end and kind of get the work done right so for example in the i don't want to pick on christopher's course but in the cloud if you kind of wait and jam like uh, you know crunch towards the end you can do assignments done because there is nothing really uh fundamentally new such that you need to spend time practicing it right you just need to have it done in this course you cannot do that because this course requires kind of a buildup of certain skills and certain understanding that you cannot cramp into the last two weeks of the course. You will have to work a bit more systematic to kind of get the value here, right? So I encourage you not to postpone things until later, but do a little bit every week. Like you don't need to do all the laps. You don't need to even finish the laps, but try to think about them and try to do a little bit every week more systematically, right? Um, yeah, I I feel your pains. I know it's hard, and especially with the four um four courses per semester. All right, so uh, let's have a break. Um, and then we are gonna talk about some uh elegance in coding. Uh, so let's see. Eight minutes. Yeah, let's do eight minutes. All right, so there was a question um, uh, because people didn't see the, the whiteboard. So I will repeat the, the part about the brackets and the um, dollar sign, but I will also generate a new lecture project. So let's call it his buzz. New. Uh, his boss. All right. So I will use code 
for this. Okay. Where is my code? Code. Yep. Let's see. Right, so um, I was basically saying that uh, sometimes you will see code which has a structure like this. So you'll have something like um, do something and then dollar sign and then um, yeah, do something else dollar sign and then so on and then you sort of see this kind of a tower of code which is sort of like this and then the dollar sign is used to to link that you kind of need to do certain things in certain order and that is typical like a typical use of the dollar sign the other typical use of dollar sign is that you have some sort of a functional um um function composition. So for example, you're saying print me something that has been shown and then th that has been mapped or whatever, right? W whatever you are doing. Uh, and then you have this kind of a final thing. And then the final thing is some sort of expression or some, some kind of a piece of code, right? So you're doing this kind of a more complex kind of a function composition. I is that visible or is it too small? Um, can make it bigger yeah and then um yeah but if we make it too big we losing the so let's shorten it so we have this kind of pattern and then you're passing the final final you know something uh, such that you are doing certain things and then passing the final thing and then you're doing dollar sign. Uh, mixing the dollar signs kind of in the middle uh, and the brackets, usually it's not uh, common. Uh, you will see code like this, but sometimes it's a little bit um, ugly looking and harder to read or harder to maintain. So the, the typical use cases for dollar is like this final thing for the initial logic or this kind of a tower uh, or, or like linear structure. Um, but as I said, it, it, there is no real rules. Like it depends, like it's in the eye of the holder, right? So some people find certain patterns easier to read and so on. So it, you kind of, you have to use your own judgment, right? So that was about the brackets and the uh, brackets and the dollar sign. Okay, so here um, we have the initial sequence and, you know, hold and behold, it's a FIS bus, right? So we have a FIS bus problem, right? We supposed to generate a sequence which has a certain properties, right? Uh, and those properties are that given a number N, we have to check if the number is divisible by three. And then if it is, we print FIS, if it isn't, then we check if the number is divisible by five, and then we print bus, right? And then if it isn't divisible, if, if it is divisible by three and five, we print fizz bus, which is, you know, concatenation of fizz and bus. And then if it isn't, we just print the number as it is, right? So, you know the problem, uh, it's a abstract, useless problem, which has certain structure, right? The structure is that we have to do two checks. We have to do check for division by three and by division by five and do you know, certain actions if it is divisible by three and divisible by five. So, right? 
the, the choice of this division by three and five is just a, a, an example, right? You can imagine that it's something else, that we're doing test A and test B. And if test A is done, we have to do certain things. And if test B is done, we have to do certain things. And if test A and B are done and they are true, both of those things have to happen. And then if none of that is true, then a third thing needs to happen, right? That is the structure of this problem. And abstractly speaking, we can kind of think about test A and test B, not about division by three and division by five, right? Um, that's how we should use it as a kata. What, what is kata? Kata is like a small programming problem that we try to solve, right? Um, so, <clears throat> so what do you think about repeating code? in general, if you have to copy and paste code or repeat yourself in, in your code, is it okay or is it not okay? It's not okay. Generally, it's not okay. Sometimes we have to do it, but it's still not okay. Even if we have to do it, right? It's still not okay. So generally it's not okay. All right, so we established that. So there is like a small quiz. Um, okay, let's, let's do it. You have to type? Type the answer. All right, so the final exam in Inspera will have some things that you have to fill in and some things that you have to type. And I'm kind of practicing that with you here such that you know uh, we all agree what is problematic and what is not problematic, right? So if you say, don't repeat yourself, uh, don't repeat yourself uh, with the proper uh, apostrophe, that's the correct answer. But if you said don't, Without the apostrophe, that's not the legal English and that's not the correct answer, right? Even though for a human, uh, it's almost the same, right? The human grader would grade there, yeah, that's correct answer. But it like the computer will say, no, it, it's not, right? So to be on the safe side, you have to be precise, <laughs> right? So there are two correct answers. One is with apostrophe and one is do not. They are also correct, right? But all the variations are kind of not correct. And the computer will say those are not correct. So you have to be kind of uh, precise in the exam. I do, and the other grader check exam manually as well. And if we do see this, we usually correct it to be a correct answer, right? Uh, but to be on the safe side, it's better to just say that, right? All right, so uh, do not repeat yourself. That's important. What else is important? So, you know, this buzz is a very trivial problem. Um, so Frosty, congratulations. Um, but can you do this bus without doing if else statements at all? In any language. If you can do it in C++, ah, man, you're my hero. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it without if else statements in C++, but man, that's not a nice code. So, all right. So how would you do it? How would you do it without if else statements? For example, in Haskell. Yep. Nice. Exactly. Perfect. So let's do it. So we go and we say we have a fizzbus. So fizzbus, and then we say we have a fizzbus function which takes an integer and produces for us a string. And then, hold and behold, Copilot says, yeah, let's do pattern matching, okay? 
Um, all right, is that code correct? Yep, it's correct. Is that code cheating? Yep, it's cheating because we have 15, right? It kind of changed the nature of the problem, right? Uh, to, to keep in the spirit of the problem, we have to do this. Um, we have to do uh, n mod 5, right? We have to kind of uh, do this. We have to say um, we have to check if it's divisible by 3 and divisible by 5. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Thanks. So that is better, right? Mm -hmm. But here we obviously see we're repeating ourselves. We're doing that check here and here, right? So that is a little bit shit, right? So it is good. We're not using if statements, but we are repeating ourselves here and here and here and here. So uh, Copilot is a little bit solution here is kind of nice, but it's a little bit shitty, right? Can we do that with pattern matching, but without shitty repeat of ourselves? Yeah. You could do where, but where would only hide the repeat? But it's better, right? We do the actual check in one place, right? And we kind of do the test in one place and then we kind of reuse the, the result in two places, right? So that, that would be fine. So uh, that, that, that is not a bad su suggestion actually. So we could use where, uh, which is okay. What else can we do? What else do you know you could do to not repeat yourself and do, yeah? Yeah, you could do functions, but that is a little bit harder, right? Like let's, so, so um, functions, um, it's okay as well, but let's do one more. Uh, so let's call this one a shitty one. Um, it's, it's less shitty than with the 15, but it's still a bit shitty. So let's do fizzbuzz, um, the same, as before, but now, uh, oh yeah, so here, oh, well, it actually suggested the one with where, <laughs> right? So it's kind of, a, we, we prompted it here to use where and Copilot kind of, a, a, kind of made a version for us where we do the check once, right? Okay, fair enough. So let's let's call it with a tick. All right, that one is not bad, uh, but that's not what we want. Um, we want, okay, so we want another one with um, case. Can you do case for us? Fizzbus. And it can. Uh, and that would be nice, but I don't like this one. It's a little bit difficult to read. So what I would like is I would like to do it like this. Uh, I would say n mod three. Yep, that's the way. All right. So this code doesn't repeat the checks, doesn't use the where, uh, but it also kind of uses nice the structuring and it kind of forms a tuple for us. And then we match on the tuple, right? And that is actually a very nice pattern. You will see that pattern sometimes in your problems where you have to do two checks, but then you have to do some action based on both of the checks or three checks. And then this kind of a pattern matching on the tuples is a, a nice way to go, right? Um, so. Here we like we could equal it to zero and, and use true false here, but we can as well just use zero, right? Um, often it's a, those are boolean checks, and you end up having kind of a, some some checks and saying, oh yeah, if this is true and that is true, I have to do this. But if those are both false, I have to do this and blah blah blah, right? And then this code will be very 
maintain, maintainable and very easy to read, right? And it's kind of a nice pattern to do, right? So in both Rust and Haskell, probably this is the kind of the most idiomatic way actually to solve that problem, right? You can solve it in many different ways, of course, but in terms of actual elegance and in terms of reusability and maintenance and so on and so forth, I would go with this one, right? Um, all right, so then we can do functions. Um, so functions, let's say, uh, also okay. And we call this one with double. Yeah, so let's call it with double fizzbus2. And then let's do one with functions, fizzbus. Okay, so we take an int and produce an int. And now we need to have um, those test A and test B as additional functions, right? So what we can do is we can say fizz takes an integer and produces a string for us. Um, so there is a if statement, but we can turn it. Um, uh, with guards, okay, can it generate with guards? This, yeah, it can generate with guards, it's nicer. So if you can, um, if you have a choice of if statements or pattern matching or guards, go with pattern matching or guards. It's, it's easier to read. It's kind of um, more in your face, right? So here we clearly see that if n divides by three, then we print this. Otherwise, we print nothing, right? So in a similar spirit, we do bus. Yeah, we have bus in the same spirit. And then if we combine them, um, we have, okay, that was not too bad. So copilot says, do this. Um, yeah, it, it is okay-ish, but why just don't do it in a single line, right? Why not just do it as this n plus bus bus n? Do this, right? This, yeah, let's make it better formatted. Okay, so now we have this kind of a pattern matching here. We nicely compose the final fizz bus from producing fizz first and then bus after. So if the number divides by three and divides by five, we will have the concatenation of fizz and bus, right? So we, we kind of nicely compose the solution from the first and second test. But, so, so this one is nice, it works, but it has this kind of ugly if in the beginning here, because we have to check if the fizz plus bus gives us nothing. If they give us nothing, that means the number is not divisible neither by uh, three or five. So test A and test B failed, and we have to fall back to this third uh, case, right? Um, and we are doing it by this if statement, right? So could we have kind of a nicer solution where we don't have to do this if here? Um, and uh, the answer is yes, we could in, in Haskell. Um, and it actually looks very nice. Uh, I, I'm going to show you here. So not here. I'm going to show you here. So... I don't want... I don't want you, yeah, I don't want to show you the actual solution. I just want to show you the final sequence. So the final sequence is we computing this n, we computing bus n, and then we computing the final check if that was just a number not divisible by fizz or bus. And fizz produces this partial solution for fizz, for the first prefix. Then bus produces the bus. So we can we will have fizz bus for 15. 
and uh, fizz for three and bass for five and, and so on. But if those two produce nothing, then this final one will put the text of the final number, right? In as, as a solution. And then we get the solution. So our computation is actually this sequence, which is exactly the most elegant solution for the fizz bus with no kind of if statements here, right? Uh, it like this one hints to you that I'm using a state monad and we will learn how to do this why, why, once we learn about states and state monads, right? Uh, but I'm, I'm just kind of wanting to show you that ultimately that is the most elegant, most composable solution, which is sort of a structured the same way as the problem structure, right? Um, so we're doing the fizz, we're doing the bus, we're doing the simple number, and then we're getting the solution and that's it, right? It's kind of a nice sequence of computations that needs to happen. Uh, there is no branching, there is no kind of a weird else or whatever, right? It's just a linear problem solution, right? To the fizz bus. So we're gonna come back to this and we're gonna learn how this actually is possible, uh, but we need to learn a little bit more about monads and about, um, how we can represent state in a computation uh, in Haskell such that we can get this solution. Can you get this type of solution in um, C++? Yes, you can, but the syntax is so ugly that like I don't care like even to, to start trying to do it, right? Uh, I've seen it, it looks uh, the same, <laughs> but the syntax is so ugly that you cannot read it. Like it's uh, almost unreadable, right? Can you do this solution in Rust? Same story. You can, but it's like uh, syntax gets in a way. Like you're, like to express this in a, other languages than Haskell, the syntax makes it very, very com you know com convoluted, complicated. Uh, in Haskell, it it, it isn't. In, in Haskell, it is actually very elegant, right? Um, but you need to know a little bit of machinery how you can actually do this, right? Um, so we will come back to that later. For now. This is okay, but as I said, probably this one is the, the most idiomatic way of doing it, right? If you Google FizzBus in Haskell, you will get a ton of different solutions, right? And most of them use if statements or some pattern matching, but the, most of them use 15, right? And that is sort of cheating, like it's, it, 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 it kind of violates the nature of the problem, right? The, the problem is test A, test B, and, and, and you cannot produce test C, which is like a combination of both. You actually have to do test A and test B, right? Um, so the uh, first bus with 15 is kind of missing the point actually, right? Okay, any questions about this? Yep. Yep. I will upload the code after after the class. So the code is here. I will come back to that um, and I will upload it for you to have a look. All right, so then um, how much time we have? Yeah, we have 15, 15 minutes. So let's do, uh, let's try to do two more. So I have this one. Oh, come on. Given three numbers, why it doesn't... Now it shows. So again, we have two very simple problems. Um, so let's do the first first. So we have um, um, we have a, um, a a task to write a function, which given a list of three numbers, um, returns a string with those numbers being comma separated, okay? So let's go again to, to here and we will say, um, given a list of three numbers, return a string with those numbers comma separated. Okay, so yeah, so in fact, we can actually use it as a test. So we can say um, convert three, and then uh, it takes the three numbers and produces us that string in doc test, right? Nice. So 
we in Haskell, you cannot say I have a list of three numbers. You have to say I have a list, right? Uh, there is a way of saying that you have a list of three numbers. You have to define your own type and you have to use those kind of a constraints, but it's like a lot of machinery for not much benefit, right? Uh, why? Uh, because maybe uh, the boss will come and say, yeah, by the way, remember when I told you it has to be three numbers? Uh, yeah, actually our spreadsheet grow. Now it's five numbers, right? So. Chances are, your, if your solution is actually generic and deals with three numbers, but has the other number as an edge case, it will be better because then you can kind of check those preconditions and just change them, right? Uh, you can ask the boss, okay, should the function actually work for 10 as well? And the boss says, yeah, it could work for 10 because we're doing checks somewhere else, right? We're doing the preconditions check somewhere else and then your logic can work for 10. So then your solution can be generic, right? Um, so anyway. Uh, let's let's um, like not deal really with this. So we have um, this solution generated by Copilot. <laughs> and how would you rate the quality of that solution? No. So there are two problems with this solution. And there are two reasons why this solution is shit, okay? Uh, the first reason is it's not generic, right? why it should not be generic. It, it could be, like if, if, if the implementation is easy, it should be generic, right? The second one is there is a, you know, yellow to toggle over it. Why? Can you tell me why the compiler is not happy with it? Yeah. Exactly. Our pattern matching is not exhaustive, right? So we kind of need to, um, uh, add extra logic here to explain uh, what we do for an empty list, what we do for a list with one element, what we do with the list of two elements, what we do with list of four elements, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so, okay, we would have to kind of add extra patterns to deal with those edge cases, which are kind of going beyond, right? So, okay, so th th that one is kind of shit. Um, completely, but we can uh, try to patch it with, um, okay, so say using guards, and then let's see. Okay, that's better, right? So now uh, it says, uh, it's still, it is still a little bit shit, uh, because we have to say we have a list. If the length of the list is three show x show blah, 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 and then list must have blah, 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 and then we have to say where um okay why this is shit yeah we kind of uh we just learned don't repeat yourself like i'm repeating that sequence here like uh three times why why i'm repeating myself right so what can we do else hmm. yeah exactly destructure it so we can decompose it into this, okay? All right, into this. And then we are kind of back to that uh, compiler being unhappy, right? So now the compiler is stupid because we know we're not doing this really in this case. We only really, really need this for this case. And this case says it's enforcing three, right? So we kind of see the limitations of the compiler. Um, most of the time, Haskell compiler is actually pretty good. Like I don't hit those types of compiler limitations a lot. I Occasionally you do, uh, but you do hit this compiler, this type of compiler limitations a lot in Rust. And Rust forces you to do certain things because the compiler doesn't know what you know from the code that that will never happen, right? But it has like, to make Rust compiler happy, you have to go with it, right? Uh, so there is a lot of play of like making your solutions fit into the thinking of the Rust compiler because Rust compiler is a little bit more dumb, right? Um, so anyway, uh, this still is shit, right? It, it's still not generic and it's still kind of ugly like hell. So how can we do this? Uh, how can we actually write the convert method such that it works for three 
it works for other numbers. Uh, we can have the check uh, if we want to do the check here or elsewhere. Typically, we want to do it elsewhere. So typically, uh, the input validation, like why would that list be other than three, uh, is not up to you, right? This is just a logic of converting something to comma-separated values. You should not care like what is being given to you, right? Uh, as long as you can convert it to comma-separated values. So the logic of input validation that there is some something somewhere wrong that instead of three, you're getting four should be handled somewhere else who, in, in the logic which is responsible for input validation, right? Not the business logic here, right? So generally, we would like to have a solution which is actually um, composable uh, Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we can actually do this, right? And say, okay, Copilot, handle that for us. Can you do that? Actually, you know, because, yeah. So, um, Yeah, that, that that's not a uh, um that's not um uh, a worst solution. Um but it's wrong, right? So the idea is okay, but the actual logic is wrong. So what copilot is trying to do is trying to uh fold our list by doing show of the element, so converting it to a string and then concatenating it with the uh, comma. Uh, and then um, uh, kind of a carrying over the accumulator such that we do it like item by item, right? What What is the problem with this one? The problem with this one is that we're gonna end up with this kind of a hanging comma at the end because we, we have to do the same thing for each element. So if we are adding comma after each element, we're gonna add comma after the last element. That That's not what we want, right? So it's a little bit... Um, it would, it is possible to use fold, but it would be a little bit ugly uh, at the end because we have to deal with this edge case of the last element, right? So we don't want to do that. So let's uh, do something else. So we're gonna do uh, print. We're gonna do, yeah. So we can do this, right? Um, you have two functions. You have intercalate and you have intersperse. Uh, and then if you do this, uh, you have to import it. Um, and then the other way is be because what, what we want to do is we want to convert each item into its string representation, right? So we're going to map show over all the elements, right? Then we will have a list of all the text elements. And then we want to inject space, um, uh, comma space in between all the elements. And that's what intersperse uh, intersperses, right? So inter uh, intersperse would inject comma space for all our elements, right? And then once we have that, we need to combine it uh, into a single string, right? So we need to concat it. Um, uh, but because concat intersperse is the same as intercalate, so we can say intercalate, intercalate. So that is, um, and we need to import it uh, from data list. And that is sort of the um, a generic, robust, and very nicely readable and very simple solution, right? Uh, it's a very concise, and it's sort of um, the way you should solve it, basically, right? Um, can you solve it like this in Rust? Uh, possibly. Uh, you just need to check the standard libraries or some crate which has this kind of intercalate functionality or just write your own, right? Uh, where you can kind of inject something between all the elements in the list or a vector, right? Um, can you do that in uh, C++ or C? Yeah, you can, but you probably need to add this machinery yourself, right? Uh, is intercalate reusable? Yes, of course. It's it's a very reusable kind of function. Uh, it's useful for you know many use cases, right? 
Um, so again, uh, going from the initial uh, copilot suggestion to this kind of an elegant solution requires a little bit of thinking how to solve it, right? Uh, in a generic way, not how to solve it in Golang or how to solve it in a particular language, but how to solve it in a kind of an abstract way, right? So I have a, this abstract list numbers, but I need strings. So first I need to convert them all to strings. And then once I have them as strings, if I combine them, it will be like a blob of numbers, but I need to inject comma space between them. How can I do that? Okay, there is a functionality to do that, right? Uh, if there isn't, you implement it, right? You can actually do that in C, like you can have this type of solution done in C, right? Uh, but you would have to Im implement your own intercalate and your own map <laughs> over uh, array, right? Because C doesn't kind of give you kind of a mapping. Or you could use a for loop, right? You could use a for loop over a, uh, the thing and kind of do something like this, right, in C. But your kind of logic of the solution would be kind of the same, right? So now if I solve it like this, I can give it as a Haskell code to my C programmer and say, you know, I want a solution to be kind of like this, and then you implement it in C. And if the programmer uses for loop, that's fine, right? Uh, but it, at least the structure of the solution has a kind of this pattern, right? All right, so then uh, we're running out of time, but um, so given a list of three numbers, um, swap the first and last one. So we have swap three. Again, it evaluates to that, great. We have, okay, Copilot suggests a generic um, solution this time. It doesn't put int, even though I said numbers, right? Okay, there, there is a progress and it uses this, right? Um, so again, um, again, shitty solution works fine, but shitty for two reasons, not generic and not uh, pattern exhausting, right? I, I have to uh, actually exhaust all the patterns, which is not that trivial, right? It, it could be much better to do a generic one, right? So how would you do the generic one? How would you do a generic solution where you say, I have the first element and I have all the rest. Um, and then, you know, I want to swap the first with the last. And it will work for three, but it will also work for four, right? Is it a mistake that it works for four? Again, usually not. Usually the business logic, if it's written in a generic way, that's fine. You do your input validation and your kind of sanity checks somewhere else in a module which is responsible for that, right? So if somebody calls this function with four elements, but it never supposed to happen, it's not really this method responsibility to be checking that, right? This method should just work the checks should be some contained in somewhere else, right? So usually a kind of a generic solution is um, is the one that you want. And the copilot is sort of uh, not really um, helpful. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I will stop here. Um, code will be in the, in the repo. I will not fill that method, fill it as a homework, right? How to just do it in generic way, right? Uh, the first element is X. You just need to get the last element of XS, right? Easy, right? And then you need to concatenate it with the rest in the middle, okay? Um, so that's the how you kind of think about the problems in a more generic, more sort of abstract way. And then you map it to a particular implementation, right? All right, so that's it for today. Uh, we will continue um, we will continue next week. Uh, and I will put this code in uh, and we will start doing a little bit more advanced applicative uh, processing uh, next Friday. So see you, some of you in the lab in two hours. Thank you.